On June 5th, 793, a storm was approaching the shores of the Kingdom of Northumbria. A few months earlier, Althing, the Council of Vikings, made the decision to plunder its largest abbey, the famous Linda's Farm. One of the leaders of this expedition was Jarl Ulf Ironbeard, a stern but respected man among his people. However, it wasn't meant for all of the Northmen to reach Lindisfarne by the sea. A storm that hit the coast of Northumbria has scattered some of their ships miles away from their destination. Ulf's raiding party landed near a town called Bamborough. The Northmen saw it as an easy target to plunder. Little did they know that all of Northumbria was just coming out of a bloody civil war. Troops of a new King Ethald were battling remnants of recently murdered King Osred's royal army. For this reason, heavy garrisons were scattered throughout the country, and one of them was stationed just outside Bamborough. Overwhelmed by the forces of the enemy, cut off from their ships, the Northmen had to escape. Those who did not retreat in time lost their lives or became captives. Once harsh invaders looking for prey, the Northmen suddenly became prey themselves. Luckily, they found salvation in a nearby forest, which became their temporary shelter. Here, they could catch a moment of respite from the pursuing Britons. Here, Jarl Ulf Ironbeard, who suffered injuries during the fight, could heal his wounds and recover. However, a new problem arose for the people of the North. In order to survive and to have any chance to join the rest of the expedition against Lindisfarne, they had to gather food and supplies. This is how I joined the Northmen in their raid on Lindisfarne. Ethel had held me captive for months, and that was my chance to get even. When Jarl Ulf Ironbeard regained his strength and we collected enough supplies, we could finally head on to join the rest of the expedition. However, the road to Lindisfarne was not an easy one. Every once in a while, we encountered Ethel's troops. Our supplies ran out faster than we were able to loot the surrounding villages. It was then that the scouts noticed an approaching caravan with food and weapons. We prepared an ambush, not expecting that someone else was preparing to attack it as well. I do not know if we could have broken the Britain's garrison without the help of Hrothgar. Now our paths were parting and this mighty son of Northumbria was setting out to continue his struggle against Ethel's army. As for us, we could head to Lindisfarne. There was only one obstacle left on our way, a heavily guarded bridge to the island where the monastery was situated. To overcome it, we needed additional manpower. While Jarl Ulf started to prepare our troops, the scouts reported on the Viking ships circling the shore. For some reason, however, they maintained a distance and there was no way to contact them. We knew that attacking the Lindisfarne bridge head-on was nothing short of the very height of folly. Jointly, we called for a general revamp and set off for wayside farms, aware that our empty bellies were the worst of advisors. Strengthened, we were able to push the Britons off the bridge, drowning the escapees in deep waters. Enjoy! We rejoined with our brothers, and now we were up to any challenge. And with the last line of defense gone, the path to Lindisfarne laid before us. We eagerly rushed the monastery, expecting easy victory. Yet we were wrong. As the notoriety of our actions spread over the countryside, the abbey filled with zealous defenders, a hard fight was brewing behind those walls. And to be frank, we couldn't wait to test our strength. In 860, Varangians were routed out from the Volgian territories by joint forces of Slavs and Krivichans. Despite their triumph, though, 
Leaders of the tribes are unable to reach an understanding. Young and ambitious Pridbor, the leader of the Slavs, weaves a plot against popular and cold-headed Krivich Mitsislav. Pridbor knows his forces are way too weak to take Mitsislav head-on, and the young prince's plan is dependent upon help from a famous Nordic ruler, Rurik. In order to keep his plan low-key, Pridbor seeks help from me after I exiled into the wild, driven by my mysterious visions. I was blessed with visions of the future that showed me Rurik's control of the Slavs' territory. Odin himself must have anointed the Nordic ruler, and thus I accepted Pridbor's quest. With the young prince's blessing, I took the role of a royal envoy and made my journey to the Baltic Sea. Weeks later, the sightings of the Viking ships proved my visions true. Rurik, accompanied by his brothers, sets his foot on the Varangian territory. His ambition? Headship of the Varangian tribes. Rurik's victory is Pridbor's fall. You can't make someone do your dirty work and expect deference. Odin's my witness, the young prince will end up belly up in Volga if he won't heed his vehement temperament. Truvor, Rurik's older brother, makes my words prophetic. The ceremony turns into a brawl as Pridbor took offense, ending up with a sharp shiv to his throat. The future king, Rurik, makes nothing of this affront. Quite the contrary. He asks me to join his brother Sinius during next day's rush on Belazersk. I reluctantly agree, as there's no secret that this heretic is romancing with Christianity. If he wasn't my king's family, by Odin's name I'd beat him to the crows. With Rurik's flag waving over Belazersk, his army was ready to ride on Holmgard, a stronghold ruled by Pridbor's bloodkin, Vasily. I joined his army right in front of Holmgard's gates. Surprised Rurik hasn't started his assault yet. But the Nordic king has a different agenda. He sent Vasily an ultimatum. Holmgard should be handed over to Rurik, and in return, the citizens will be spared the bloodshed. Vasily's response was blunt and decisive. His arrow landed just a few feet from Rurik's horse. Rurik kept his calm and lifted his finger in the air. The first column of his soldiers split in two, making way for Truvor, holding Pridbor on a leash like a dog. Vasily's eyebrows danced aghast, but before he was able to speak, Truvor's shiv sliced the prince's throat. I looked at Rurik, searching for a scent in his stoic face. Luckily, I found nothing but detest. Rurik and I knew that those who command with ruthlessness and wanton find themselves powerless when the battle is over. When the battle was won, I sought recluse to consult the gods. In the reflection of Lake Ilmen, I saw Rurik's demise, an eagle feasting on another eagle. Rurik was in danger, and the last blow would be made by his own kin. The king found me during my colloquy. I immediately told him about the visions. He was in danger from either Truvor, a man without honor or mercy, or Sinius, who sold his heart and soul to the Christians. I suggested the king to distribute some of the conquered lands to his brothers. I knew I made the king uncertain, but so far my visions have proven to be true. I suggested I join Truver during next raid to keep an eye on the brother. As I was looking over the battlefield, I heard a disquieting whizzing noise. Two eagles locked in brotherly battle, each one pecking the other senselessly. For a short moment in front of my eyes, I recalled the vision of Rurik's downfall, an eagle feeding off of his chopped kin. The king's in danger. I rushed back, riding my horse to its demise. I returned just in time. A trusty berserk, one of the king's personal guards, tried to assassinate him. In his frantic state, he had to be put down, and I was unable to determine which brother sent the assailant. The king was furious. A blow from a family always hurts the most. Odin saw in Rurik the same man I see now, a godsend. To protect him, I'd have to kill Truver and Sinius. 
yet each deed has its price. Rurik hesitantly agreed to sacrifice his firstborn to Odin. Once my job is done, I should lay low for a while to make sure the blame would be put on the remaining cribbage. I disappeared as Rurik asked, but when I reintegrated with the shadows, the voices showed me the truth. I've become a different man. A man whose voice was nothing less but a declaration of gods. And Odin does not forget. It took me almost 15 years to collect my honorarium. Rurik welcomed me with royal luxury, but what can a blind man offer to a seer? Those were earthly commodities I had no use for. I demanded my remittance be paid as agreed upon, with his firstborn. There's a special kind of madness in the eyes of kings. Rurik laughed out at me frantically and threatened with the worst kind of tortures if I was to act upon his son. I reminded him what happened to Sinius, who shunned the gods away, and to Truver, who got consumed by anger and resentment. This fool ordered his guards to throw me out of the castle, but we'll see who'll be having the last laugh. As predicted by the vision, Rurik died weeks after he refused to give his son to Odin. Due to his son's young age, Rurik was succeeded by Oleg of Novograd, who laid foundations to one of the most powerful states of that time, Kievan Rus. Yet I wasn't victorious either. I wasn't able to please Odin, so he became silent. The only way I could reignite the flame within me was through blood. I've become a nomadic warrior, a prospector of pain and a seeker of honor. I knew the only way to reunite with Odin was in Valhalla. <laughs>